So this afternoon, we will have practical applications. Um, Dr. Sharon Vaughn and Dr. Amy Grills will, will join Dr. Vaughn. But first, I want to say a little bit about Dr. Vaughn. It's very difficult to seek research on reading and reading difficulties and implementation of reading interventions in public schools without coming across the varied and deep work of Dr. Sharon Vaughn. We are so honored to have her here with us today. Dr. Vaughn is the Manuel J. Justice Endowed Chair in Education and Executive Director of the Meadow Center for Preventing Educational Risk at the University of Texas at Austin. Sharon Vaughn was the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Learning Disabilities and the co-editor of Learning Disabilities Research and Practice. She is the recipient of the AERA SIG Distinguished Researcher Award and the University of Texas Distinguished Faculty Award. She is also an avid mentor to scores of doc students and postdoc professionals in the field of reading who carry on her insights, analytical methods, creative questioning, passion, and rigor for research to benefit children in all schools, in all classrooms. She's currently the principal investigator or co-principal co investigator on several Institute for Education Sciences, National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, and U.S. Department of Education research grants in fest investigating effective interventions for students with reading difficulties and students who are English language learners. She's the author of more than 35 books, 250 peer-reviewed research articles, and 65 chapters that address issues related to research and practice with learning problems. She has worked nationally and internationally with educators from Japan, Canada, Sweden, Norway, Portugal, and Australia. And she still has time for yet another passion. She's a runner. Um, Dr. Vaughn is very integral and important to the work of TDF. She's a board member, a frequent contributor at various meetings, has contributed book chapters related to TDF presentations, and is an avid fundraiser for TDF. As I said, she's a marathon runner and has run two marathons specifically to raise funds for TDF and is getting ready to run another to benefit TDF, the London Marathon. So when information about her next run runs across your email, please consider supporting her and the Dyslexia Foundation, Dr. Vaughn. The things they don't tell you they're going to say. Um, so, th during the next um, period of time, I intend to talk to you about mechanisms for improving reading outcomes for students with uh, reading disorders, dyslexia. And these mechanisms will focus on the critical components of reading, including word reading, fluency and comprehension, but broken down in ways that we have learned are associated with improved outcomes in the most parsimonious, efficacious manner. In addition to that, I intend, with uh, Amy Grill's uh, support, to discuss how the work that she has done around anxiety management for young children can be efficiently woven in to these reading practices in ways that benefit students, both in terms of their reading success and their anxiety management. In the process of accomplishing that established goal, what I would like for you is to keep track of issues that I talk about, questions that come up, and your own experiences that will allow you to confirm or disconfirm some of the things that we're doing. So we will allow ample time at the end for you to ask myself and Amy questions, but also to uh, bring to us your thoughts and ideas that we can use in the future without crediting you. So, <laughs> so with that in mind, I'll um, begin our talk. Um, I also want to um, thank uh, Will Baker for his you know, amazing overview of the Dyslexia Foundation, 
which um, I am an enormous advocate of. For more than 30 years, the Dyslexia Foundation has been bringing together leading scientists from important fields in dyslexia research to bridge research and practice. And the most impressive thing about Will Baker and the Dyslexia Foundation is that I am unfamiliar with any organization that so clearly aligns the best science we have about improving outcomes for individuals with dyslexia and their families and builds that bridge to practice. So those two pillars serve as the foundation and building blocks for how uh, the Dyslexia Foundation operates and why I am 100% enthusiastic. And if we were going to do the hokey pokey, we would just put our whole selves in because that's important enough. Um, so special thanks. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about the design of this study. The reason I want to do that is I want to persuade you that when I talk about the findings, they come from the most rigorous um, approach to um, uh, science that we have, and that's a randomized control trial. So whenever you want to know, whether it's in health or medicine or education or diet or nutrition, or um, kinesiology, whether an outcome is robust, the most defensible way to determine that is whether there are randomized control trials to support that particular finding. So earlier, Amy gave you lots of good examples of randomized control trials that were related to how we can improve um, anxiety management and how cognitive behavioral therapy type approaches can be utilized not just by clinicians like Amy, but also can be operationalized by tutors. So in this particular study that I'm going to be talking about, we are going to be talking about how we screened all third and fourth grade students. We included them based on criteria of very low reading scores. These students were then randomized to one of three conditions. One of the conditions is a condition in which they received a reading intervention with the anxiety management um, practices that Amy talked about earlier. The second condition is one in which they received that same reading intervention, small group, tutors that we hired and trained in both cases, and as a comparison, they got math activities and games. And the reason we did that is we wanted to hold the reading condition constant in both of those treatment arms. And so we used math as a component to, um, uh, to use the same amount of time for our anxiety management, if that makes sense to you. And then the third condition is called a business as usual condition. The business as usual condition in these schools was that now that we were in there providing highly trained interventionists, they now poured all of their resources into their business as usual condition kids. So our business as usual condition is really a school treatment condition. It's kind of unfortunate because it's um, a little harder to actually understand the effects of your treatment. So as Amy and others have wisely told us, there's a strong rationale for why anxiety is a focal point in our treatment. We know it's common. We know that 60% of middle grade students have persistent reading difficulties, and they also report heightened anxiety. So by the time these reading difficulties get to the upper elementary middle grades, two thirds of the students also report anxiety problems. There's a bidirectional directional relationship that we've been told about, and that promising findings have emerged for reduction of students' anxiety symptoms using some of these school-based interventions. In other words, ideally, we might want someone trained as well as Amy Grills to work one-on-one -on -one with every student, but she's already busy enough. So we have to find other mechanisms for um, capitalizing on what we know about these approaches and either integrating them into interventions or maybe school-wide practices. The 
theoretical um, underpinnings of this uh, study. First of all, let me just see by a show of hands how many of you are familiar with the simple view of reading. Okay, let me just say this about the simple view of reading. It's not simple. Um, that is a cute name for actually a very complex idea. The complex idea is that word reading is a multiplicative uh, component with linguistic comprehension. And this combination, this, if you will, uh, formula equals reading comprehension. So the reason it's simple is that there are only a few terms used. The reason it's complex is because what needs to be understood is that word reading is a composite of things that include phonological awareness, all of the phonological core elements, including what Marianne Wolf has made all of us pay attention to, which is rapid automatic naming, um, the components related to decoding and word reading. But that is a multiplicative effect with linguistic comprehension, which is things like vocabulary, word meaning, if you will, background knowledge, understanding the linguistic complexity of our language, particularly as it maps to print. But what's important is that because it's multiplicative, in the early stages of reading, the word reading component of this simple view of reading takes on an enhanced and heightened role in terms of giving students access to print. And then the access to print actually contributes to the building of the vocabulary knowledge, word meaning, and the background knowledge. And so over time, that linguistic component, the, the language component, the background knowledge, the vocabulary, take on an elevated view. But what we have done in the area of reading interventions is we have, in my view, a misunderstanding about reading comprehension, which is we talk about it as the thing we teach, as in, I'm going to teach reading comprehension. And I think that's a mistaken idea, because what you are going to do, hopefully, if you are doing this what I would call well, is enhance and build those component skills that allow students to comprehend text. You don't teach reading comprehension. You allow reading comprehension to manifest. And so this argument that gets unfortunately made, mostly outside of this room, that all we, meaning people involved in dyslexia, care about is phonics, and all they, meaning non-interested non, non in dyslexia people care about is reading comprehension, is a straw man and a false argument. We all want students to love to read and to learn from reading and to be engaged in reading. I know no one who doesn't want that. The argument is solely about how we give access to that for every student, not just those students who learn it automatically, effortlessly, and without the kind of quality instruction that those in this room have labored most of their adult life to provide. So, thank you. so that's why the simple view of reading, in my judgment, is not so simple, but it serves as the foundation for what Amy and I are doing in this project. So just to also, I'm setting the stage, and then I promise I'll talk about our practices, which is probably all you're really interested in, but this makes me feel better, so thank you for indulging me. The assessment timeline for this is that the intervention occurs over a two-year period. And during that two-year period, the reading intervention occurs for about, um, oh, 80% uh, of the time in small groups. And as Amy very clearly specified, about five to 10 minutes of that time focuses on anxiety management that over time is increasingly woven into the treatment 
and the interventionists learn how to use it at point of need in addition to the instruction. So by as on point of need, what I mean is they observe that one of the students is having an anxious reaction to a task, and so they ask them to think about how they can use one of the practices in the strong student toolbox, okay? So that's how it would be at point of need. So over the two-year period, we assess the students at the beginning, we assess them at the end of year one. During the summer, we allow them to read constantly. Please don't die laughing. In the beginning of the second year, we pretest them again. We post-test them at the end of the second year. And then six months later, we follow them up. So there's five assessment periods for a two-year intervention. We have um, the students in this are um, uh, not mostly male. We have about equal numbers of males and females. We have um, students that are pretty heterogeneous with respect to race and home language. And of course, the students begin in years three and four, grade three and four, and continue through grade four and five. There's approximately 80 sessions per year. They last approximately 30 minutes. They are scheduled to occur five days a week with all of the um, interruptions that occur in schools. The groups are approximately three to five, and all of the tutors that provide these treatments are hired by us and trained by us. So Amy and I do all of the training. So now I will tell you about what you're actually interested in. The intervention components for this, and I'm first going to tell you about, remember the treatment arm that was the reading and math treatment arm? Yes. OK, so I'm going to tell you about that one first. And you're going to see that all of the components overlay in the reading and anxiety, with the exception of math practice activities in the math and the um, anxiety management components in the reading and anxiety. So we have a word study component, and we do that daily. And the reason we focus on the word, and we focus on the word very strongly, is because I'm just going to tell you something I'm sure you haven't noticed. It is impossible to read if you can't read the word. I, I know, I, it's always a breakthrough for people whenever I say that, so I'll give you a few seconds to digest it. But it seems to really still be a controversy in the world that somehow you can bypass the word and learn to read. Maybe that's where guessing comes in or looking at pictures. But quite honestly, universally, it will not help you. The best way to get to comprehension is to be able to read words and know what they mean. I'm just going to say that again. You've got to be able to read the words, and you've got to know what they mean. So we spend a lot of time, and we work very hard on patterns. So we are not as, in, we are not as invested in learning rules as we are in the inferential learning, what many people would call statistical learning, that results from understanding the patterns in our language. And we work very hard to embed those into word reading and into sentences and to phrases. And so we want the most parsimonious approach to word reading as we can get. So what I mean by that is students who get these patterns quickly, we move quickly through the patterns, we move very quickly through sentences and text. For those students who don't acquire that quite as proficiently, we back up, unpack, and scaffold all of that word reading in a much more um, scaffolded, systematic way. But we don't want every student to be burdened with too many rules because it consumes a lot of their cognitive processing. And they need that cognitive processing for comprehension, for understanding text, and for fluency. So we don't want it burdened too much. We only do that when it's really necessary. So I'm not saying never. I'm saying you want the most efficient approach possible, and you use it when necessary. Fluency with text, we work very hard on word level fluency, as well as sentence level fluency, as well as paragraph level fluency, as well as longer text fluency. So back and forth like an accordion. We don't, I am not a huge fan of leveled books. I know that is like the mantra of the world. Um, but let me tell you why I'm not a huge fan of leveled books. How many of you read on your level? I mean, I don't even know what my level is, <laughs> right? 
I mean, if somebody gave me a box of books and said, that's where you got to go, I would be extremely unhappy. The reason is because, and this is a fact, the level of text you can understand is related to your knowledge and interest in that text. So the higher your interest and knowledge and background knowledge and vocabulary, the higher the text is you can read. And what we need to do with the students we're most interested in, because all of us have this in common, we, we teach the students no one else is successful teaching. OK? And those students are all reading below level, which means that we can't afford to incrementally move them up levels. We have to give them opportunities to read the kind of text that's going to be part of their content area learning. So I call that stretch text. Now, I don't want stretch text to be used when students are reading alone. I don't want stretch text to be used in big groups when I can't support and access their and facilitate their acquisition of that stretch text. But having chances to read stretch text gives students confidence and also helps them access more challenging text, which they're going to run into online, on web, everywhere. Academic vocabulary, we work very hard on academic vocabulary. And the way I'm going to conceptualize it for you is we like to teach essential words, essential academic words, like let's take equal. Equal is a very important word. Equal is important because it's important in mathematics. Equal is important because it's important in social studies. Equal is important because from equal you get equality, equanimity, right? Equal becomes a very important cognate. So we like to select these very influential cognates, and we use them as springboards for teaching background knowledge, and we use them as essential words for building a much bigger and better vocabulary. We also, in this particular intervention, have math practice. And so they do daily math practice activities for five minutes. And these were, tend to be sort of fun activities that were at about the level they were. And this takes the place of what we did with the anxiety. So now on to the next slide, which is the intervention for reading and anxiety. And I will just call to your attention that there's only one um, component that's different, it's the component at the end. The rest of the components are the same. And that component is the Strong Student Toolbox, which Amy described to you earlier and is woven into the intervention. So now, let me just talk to you about some examples that go with the intervention that I described earlier. So um, in the word study, so I'm talking about that component right now. And oh, good, there's Michael Solis. Michael, raise your hand. Michael Solis did a lot of work on our word study work, um, oh, maybe eight years ago or something like that, and has been very influential in my work. I'm glad he's here. Uh, you can ask him any questions. He, if he doesn't know them, he'll make up the answers. The, um, so in this particular word study activity, the automaticity and high frequency words. So as most of you know, there are words that our students stumble on all of the time. Okay? I mean, you think they know that word, and then they're reading text, and they don't know that word. The, and they're high frequency of words. They occur often. There's about 4,000 words up to about fourth grade that make up about 80% of the words that students are going to have access to. So those high frequency words that are not pattern words are really important to teach, right? And you want to be sure there's a certain automaticity to those words. You want to be sure that students know that the vowel combinations that go with those words, that they understand the irregular words, and that they are able to apply these within multisyllable words. One of the things we do a lot of with respect to this automaticity and high frequency words is we do a lot of um, word uh, lists. And in these word lists, we want students to own them. So we have a lot of word lists. And the word lists have something in common in the words. So if you look at the first word list, what do you think those words have in common? Yeah, that's exactly right, because this is exactly the way you people teach. So these are O and A um, uh, are control words at the end. And what we want students to do is become owners or masters of this. So they need to be able to read these words rapidly with 
no mistakes. And then they own the list. And we actually time them on them. We keep track of the time that they do them. We want them to be faster and faster. And the reason we want speed is not because we value speed. In fact, we think, I, in fact, wait a minute, let me just tell you this, uh, this story that I loved this comic that I saw uh, about speed. And it said, um, Woody Allen said, I read War and Peace in the abridged version. It's about war and peace. Okay? And that's kind of what you get when all you go for is speed and fluency. That's not the purpose here. The purpose here is really to get students to feel the automaticity, the fluent aspect of reading, and the confidence where your shoulders are down and you're reading this because it just you can't not read it. So it would be like me saying to you, look at that third list. Look at the first word on that third list. Would you do that? Don't read it. You can't not read it, right? Like you are reading machines. And that is kind of what we want to happen to students, that when their eyes come across print, it is an effortless uh, element of what they do, not effortful, not so that after they read three sentences, you think they ran around the track 10 times. They, you want them to be able to do this in ways that they can literally gobble up text, not be exhausted by it. And I think that that requires practice and confidence. Another fluency element that we do is we think that modeling fluency is very important. We think that peer readings in fluency are important. And as we were talking about at breakfast, we think it's important for students to have opportunities to serve in both roles. So they serve in the role as the initial reader, they serve in the role as the listener and the second reader. They choral read with a partner. They take turns reading alternating sentences. So there's multiple ways in which this repeated reading can take place. And we think that peers, even in small groups of two and, I mean, excuse me, of three to five, can serve in that role very effectively because that allows you to break off with one of the students and do some of that word reading we talked about earlier. In addition, I think it is a mistake to focus on fluency without asking students something about what they read. Use fluency as an opportunity to build the fact that we only read because we want to understand. We want to engage. Reading is not work. So when we make fluency too effortful as a practice, we unfortunately teach children that reading is just work and we don't have a purpose for it. And so we establish a purpose for reading even with fluency. Um, in terms of stretch text, we know that it's important when you do this stretch text, and this is an example of a stretch text that we would use. We often use information text. I love to emphasize information text with students because information text does two things that narrative text doesn't do as well. Number one, it enhances uh, vocabulary knowledge. Number two, it builds background knowledge. And the one thing that will help comprehension more than anything else, two things. When everybody's busy teaching reading comprehension, two things will build comprehension. Word reading first, word meaning with background knowledge. If you've got those three things, 95% of the time, you've got comprehension. OK, I'll give you a little bit of inference making, but that's it. We'll talk about inference making later. So with more challenging texts like this, I'm going to tell you one other thing I like to do. When children, students are going to read stretch text, I like for them to have read easier text on the same topic before they read the stretch text. So the easier text on the same topic is basically a way to jumpstart or springboard their background knowledge about the text they're going to read that's the stretch text. So the stretch text becomes even more accessible. The third thing I like to do when it comes to stretch text is pre-teach all proper nouns. Always do that. 
Why should they try to figure out Afghanistan? I mean, these are just like, the, the whole story, they lose the comprehension of the whole story because they don't know who Mr. Thackerwary is. Because they don't even know what that word is. So just say there's three people in this piece that we're about to read. Here's their names. This one is the man that it's mostly about. This is what's going to happen. It takes place in um, uh, Middlebury, Vermont. Here's Middlebury. That's what this word is. That's a small town in a state called Vermont. You've probably never heard of Vermont either, but <laughs> I knew that. That's why I use that example. <laughs> it's a sweet little town, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so see, you threw me off my game. I don't know where I was. I don't know what I'm doing. All right. So um, you want to build background knowledge before they read the stretch text. And we always like to have students write a very brief summary statement. And I have the word sentence here, and I wish I didn't, because I don't care whether it's a sentence. A summary statement can be a few words but just a way to show that they are connecting with that text. And then after they read multiple paragraphs, write an overall sum summary of the entire passage. And we really think what that does, the way I would describe it is it wakes them up to print. Because many of the students we teach literally have this mind-numbing approach to print, right? They like literally somehow the switch is off Print is about words that you say or try to say when they're around you, and then you hope it goes away as quickly as possible, OK? And what we want to do is sort of wake them up to the fact that print is a place where you can find, learn, discover, escape. The comprehension monitoring we do, uh, and part of this waking them up to print, as far as I'm concerned, is getting them to sort of think about the fact that um, they need to monitor their text when they're reading. And you know, we've done a lot of things with monitoring. One of the things we did early on was we talked a lot about clicking and clunking. And you, some of you may have even read some of our work in this area. but. The idea is that when you're reading and the words are kind of making sense and you're engaged, things are kind of clicking, right? But if you run into a word, you don't know what it means, you can't read it, or you're kind of lost in the text, it's a clunk. And most of us have had that experience. You know, I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, it's Sunday afternoon, you finally have an hour to yourself. I know this is a dream, but let's dream this for a minute. <laughs> It's Sunday afternoon, you finally have an hour to yourself, you're sitting in your favorite chair, you pick up a book or a magazine, and you realize you've turned a page or two, but you have no idea what you've read, right? I, I mean, that really does happen to me. And that would be an example of like, you're really not monitoring at all. You're not engaged. Somehow you actually did read it, but you have no idea what you read. And so you go back and you start repairing, right? You start rereading and fixing it up because you monitor the fact that you were reading but not understanding. And we want to sort of turn kids into people who sort of ask and wonder about um, things making sense. And that's fundamentally the idea behind DIMS. Does it make sense? And I love DIMS. And, I, I, and the kids love DIMS. And what you want to do with DIMS is that you want to have errors or not in passages. And you want the students to read it and see if it makes sense. So you want to see if they're monitoring. And you want them to find those errors. So my name is Samantha, and I love to swim. It's my favorite book. Swimming helps me relax and is a good activity for my health because now I have um, muscle strength, a healthy heart, and he healthy lungs. I took classes when I was a child so that I could become a great driver one day. OK. Now, DIMS. Does all the words in that make sense? No. So you would say no. Then you would have to go back and find the words that don't make sense, right? And then you would want to replace them with words that do make sense. So the idea behind this is that we want them to kind of think about the fact that when they're reading, they're supposed to be, get ready, paying attention. And 
thinking about whether what they're reading makes sense. And what I like about DIMMs is that over time, you can start with simple sentences, build up to paragraphs. You can start with nouns, which are easier in DIMMs than verbs, which are easier than adjectives. Do you see what I mean? So you can make this more and more difficult. And you can pull sentences and paragraphs either from things which are easier that they've previously read, and then harder that are novel text. Does that make sense? So we think that DIMS is a really good way to teach students to monitor text. And by the way, Michael, this is true, right? It's one of their favorite things to do. Yep. He said yes, so it's true. Um, then in terms of intervention examples around vocabulary, so we think that while context clues are a very bad way to learn to read a word, I want you to hear that, they can be a very good way to in develop your understanding of the meaning of the word, OK? So context clues are not very helpful for word reading, but they're pretty good for word meaning. But now I'm going to give you another uh, important uh, caveat. Context clues for word meaning are much better with information text than they are with narrative text. Okay, so it's much harder to figure out what a word means in narrative text than it is in information text. So you want students to kind of know something like, what is the meaning of flee as it's used here? And read around the word to look for clues. So that's what we tell students to do instead of context clues. We say read around the word. So read around the word means read that sentence or read the sentence before, or read the sentence after. That's what read around means. So in the particular sentence we're talking about, it says, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's the last sentence, and it says, there is some evidence of a mini underground railroad in South Texas that was largely fueled by poor Tejanos who helped runaway slaves flee into Mexico. So what does the word flee mean as it's used here? Thank you. One person. This is why I, I get the after lunch group. It happens, really. I don't know what I did to Will. I, you know, I'm usually pretty nice to him. But what? I, I, <laughs> she said, we have test anxiety. That's why we won't answer. No, wrong. Get out of here. Go in the corner. All right. So uh, we like, we also work, very, we think it's also valuable to work on inferences. And there are, our, at least the students that I work with, I can't speak about yours, have a lot of trouble with inferences. And inferences actually are very challenging. And we actually work very explicitly on teaching inferences. And I think I have a couple of examples of that coming up. So, um, oh, Amy, jump up here. Your voice is OK. Oh, she's giving me that look. <laughs> Amy, we're supposed to be doing this together. She's, oh, come on. She's going to make me do it. Are you going to make me do it? Yeah. All right. I don't want any correction if I make a mistake. All right. So the other intervention examples that we have built in, um, yeah, she's kind of losing her voice. That's why she's not being helpful. So she talked about these earlier. I get the microphone. I can say whatever I want. <laughs> um, she talked about these earlier, about be a detective, be a friend, be a scientist. Do you remember when she was talking about those? And we build those directly into our instruction. So in terms of be a detective, is this thought actually true? So you know, when you say all of those uh, thoughts in your head about, oh, you know, I, I, no one likes me. Oh, this group isn't going to accept me. Oh, I just read that really poorly. Oh, I'm about to make a mistake. Oh. Those are the thoughts. Amy's uh, program that she has integrated into this uh, intervention really gets students to question that and to question whether or not that's true and to assume it's not. The assume it isn't true is very helpful, especially when you're thinking 
bad things. The other one that she talked about earlier was be a friend. What would I tell a friend to do in this situation? How would I tell them to, to think about this? And actually, it really helps them think about how they should think about it. And the third thing that she and has, has taught the teachers to teach the students is that be a scientist. Am I really 100% sure that that's going to happen? So as you start to worry about things, check the certainty on that. So in terms of the intervention example, she provided this one earlier. And we actually build these into all of our lessons with respect to their daily activities, including you know, the activities that she showed earlier. So another intervention um, example is um, from the Strong Student Toolbox is the success imagery. And so an example is, today we're going to go over one or more tool for calming our bodies and getting us focused. This tool is called imagery, which sounds a little like imagination, right? Well, that's because we use our imagination to do this. Remember we talked about how professional athletes use a lot of the tools that we are using? and we're learning how to think like a professional athlete? This is totally true. With this one as well, for example, basketball players like to close their eyes right before they take a free throw to imagine it going in. So you're getting the feel for it. So these are examples of way we, it, ways we integrate this into the reading. And we integrate these practices when we ask students to read stretch text. So you're about to do something that's very difficult. We don't expect you to do this perfectly. It's too hard. But close your eyes. Imagine yourself doing the best you can. And imagine yourself relaxing when you get to hard words, knowing I'm going to be right there to help. And this is the way in which we integrate both the anxiety management into the reading intervention. And these examples, which are available in your handouts, really have helped students think about ways to tackle the more challenging examples. Now, some of you may wonder, or we have been asked in the past, what kinds of activities we do for math. So just to give you an idea, we get the activities based on the math um, instruction that's going on in the classroom. So we actually got it from them. But we took it and made it a little easier because what we didn't want to do was add anxiety to the math group. So, and we provide a lot of support for them. And we try to make it as fun and activity-like as possible. So sweet estimation, mixed numbers, balance the scales, things like that. So in the business as usual condition, which was really a school provided treatment condition, the students were mostly getting group sizes that ranged anywhere from one on one to one on 15. The range of days that it was provided was two to five. It was 10 to 60 minutes a session. And so I say the range of this because remember, we did not provide that. That was provided by the schools. And though I'm hardly in any position to discourage schools from treating any student with a reading problem, I wish they wouldn't treat them quite so well. Anyway, so um, our data analysis plan was that we were interested in the effect of the treatment on students' reading. And we looked at the extent to which it moderates the treatment effects with respect to anxiety. And we have the three groups, and that is our data analysis plan, which you are welcome to. We wanted to evaluate the treatment on the reading abilities, but we also wanted to look at um, the reading and anxiety versus the business as usual, the reading and math versus the business as usual, and then we put both of them together, okay? And this descriptive data is really um, sort of a way to just kind of give you an overview of the students in this study and how they were performing. So what I'd like you to look at, because I think it's relevant, is their Gates comprehension scores, 
which were all, on average, a standard deviation below expected level. 85 would be the cutoff for one standard deviation, so they're all lower than that. Um, if you take a look at their sight word reading, their sight word reading is also within a about a standard deviation low. If you look at their test of silent contextual uh, fluency, you'll see that those scores are also m below a standard deviation between 75 and 85. And the uh, mini reading comprehension is just a um, short version of a reading comprehension measure in which the text is um, content area text because we do a lot of work in the content area. And those are raw scores. So just look at the descriptive data. And this is from the beginning of year one till the end of year two. The blue line represents the reading and anxiety group. The red line represents the reading and math group. And the green line represents the business as usual group. And you'll see that on the gates McGinnity, there are, um, uh, vi based on visual inspection, the data seems to favor the reading and anxiety group on the test of silent uh, reading efficiency and comprehension. We have students moving from the about 88 to 100, which means that's very normal or typical performance on TaskGraph, and that would be with the reading anxiety group. If you look at the test of word reading efficiency, this is sight word reading. You're again viewing that students are scoring, you know, significantly low, more than one standard deviation at pretest. And they're moving up to about 95 standard score, which is pretty close to typical performance. I think most of us would be happy with that. The test of silent contextual reading fluency, again, significantly below average to near normal performance on the reading fluency. On the mini RC, which is the reading comprehension, we call it a mini because it's um, not a long measure. Again, the reading with anxiety group is uh, outperforming the other groups. Now, the interesting thing is while the differences between, except on two of the measures, the differences between the two reading treatments that we provided are not statistically significant, the visual inspection always favors the reading and anxiety group. And what we find sort of promising and encouraging about that um, is that um, both groups got exactly the same treatment. And they got it from exactly the same tutors. So tutors were assigned to both conditions in terms of the groups. They just had to modify the math and reading. So the only explanation for those differences is really the influence of the anxiety management component, which again, we find very promising. In terms of the mini RC, since this measure is not available to you because it's a researcher developed measure, I show you an example of it. And so the example of it is that it has um, passages with questions, and it also um, reflects some of the work we did on DIMS. OK? So I'm rolling here on the descriptive data. In terms of the anxiety measures, there's a reading anxiety a measure that Amy Grills um, developed with some support from, the, from us at the Meadow Center. But in her design of this measure, she was really interested in looking at students' self-perceptions of their reading anxiety, the extent to which they perceived themselves more anxious about being asked to do things like read aloud and various other reading-related activities. And um, this measure has, um, is really developing very nicely in terms of its psychometrics. And I think Amy's in the process of um, preparing that, um, the psychometrics for a brief report in a psychology journal. So hopefully you'll be seeing it soon. And um, I'm going to tell you how that operates as a moderator in a minute. And then this is the Beck anxiety uh, measure. And what you can see in terms of the reading and anxiety, in terms of the um, ranks group, their per self perception of reading anxiety declined from pretest to post test. And if you look at the business as usual condition, 
that looks about the same, a slight decline, but not significant. In terms of the reading and math, again, a slight decline, but not significant. So the effect of the anxiety management on reading anxiety was statistically significant. And to show it to you in terms of line graphs, which sometimes are easier to look at, again, I'll remind you that a decline is an advantage. So you want it to go down because that means it's reduced anxiety. Does that make sense? So like most of our reading measures, we want them to go up. The anxiety measures, we want them to go down. So if you look at the reading anxiety measure for the ranks group, you will see the decline that we were looking for. And if you look at the Beck Youth Inventory on anxiety, again, this is the self-report measure. Again, sloping decline for both math and reading but the decline um, uh, ultimately is greater for uh, reading anxiety, but it, it, the slope is not different for reading and anxiety and reading and math. And I was asked by someone at the lunch break to explain why the reading and math group with respect to some of the anxiety measures is outperforming the business as usual group even though it isn't outperforming the reading and anxiety group. In other words, they're not getting anxiety treatment. Why are they declining more on anxiety, which is good, than the other group? And so there are several possibilities, and Amy may want to offer others. Um, we've talked about this, but she might articulate it in a better way. Uh, one of the reasons could be that actually participating in these small group reading treatments actually um, makes students feel more confident about themselves as a reader, and therefore their anxiety about reading declines, even though they're not part of their anxiety management uh, treatment. So that's one explanation. A second possible explanation is that one of the associations with anxiety for many students is math. Many students have math anxiety. And so by building math activities in that are successful, playful, students get a lot of reinforcement from the teacher about their success in math, it could be that that reduces their anxiety and that their overall perception about their anxiety declines. So we do not know the extent to which those two influence that, if at all, but those are possible explanations. And I don't know, Amy, if you would want to say any more about that? I tell you, got the Amy stamp of approval. So um, this is, I'm not going to talk about all of these regression models, but I am going to show you this moderation analysis because I like it. So I like to talk about the things that interest me. So. The thing to remember about the moderation analysis is that basically, uh, let me see if I can do this. I don't have a pointer, so watch this. I'm going to point with my finger. Bear with me, video people. I'm coming back. OK, so if you look at where it's the 20 is right there, if you draw a line there, and only look to the left, don't look to the right, because the rest of that is not really part of the moderation, only the part to the left. What you will see is that reading anxiety is moderated by the main effect of the ranks, the reading and anxiety intervention on word reading when contrasted with the BAU group. What this means is that the path coefficient for this interaction was negative and statistically significant, indicating a significant effect for the ranks intervention so that when treatment effect was decreased about one point on the treatment group, for each of the uh, additional point increase on the word reading. So what that means is the difference between the groups was that as, there, as students in the ranks group anxiety declined, their word reading increased. And so that moderation analysis was very satisfying. So what we want to sort of emphasize here, oh my gosh, I just got a low battery sign. All right, so I better get going here. Um, what I want to emphasize is that um, regardless of the researcher or school-provided treatment, students make progress in closing the gap. And these, this progress in closing the gap suggests that treatment effects are beneficial. But here's the other thing it suggests that I find sort of interesting. 
It doesn't matter as much as we like to think what the treatment is, as long as the components of that treatment are evidence-based. So within our family of evidence-based interventions, we should not be squabbling about whether you use this evidence-based intervention or evidence-based intervention B. They all are associated with improved outcomes, and much more so than traditional approach, I don't want to call them traditional, but approaches that aren't integrating these evidence-based practices. I say that to you because we are starting to really get some momentum in the field of dyslexia, right? People are paying attention. People aren't saying there's no such thing as dyslexia. They're saying, help me understand. Help me do a better job teaching these students. So this is not the time in our history that we should be squabbling within ourselves about which of these intervention practices is better than another. That's not to suggest that you don't have every right to your own ideas about that. But as a group, let's pull together and say we know a lot about these evidence-based components. Let's make sure they're part of treatments for students. And let's really sort of get on the, how can we get this into professional development? How can we get this into pre-service training? Doesn't it break your heart when people say, I went to the schools and the teachers tell me they don't know how to teach students to read? If they don't learn to read automatically and effortlessly, we don't know what to do. That's what should break our hearts. So we want to understand that there's a lot of ways to accomplish this. We need to be responsive to the students we teach and customize our interventions based on their needs. But as long as the elements of research-based and evidence-based practices are there, let's sort of band together and move forward. The second thing is that gains compared to uh, extensive interventions in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade are diminished when compared to the gains that are made kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. That's a consistent finding. It's a consistent finding. That does not discourage me because every gain gives that student greater access to print and knowledge. But it does mean early interventions are extremely valuable. And the fact that many of our students aren't identified until third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, is more than heartbreaking. Number three, it may be necessary for us to think about more intensive and extensive interventions. What I mean by that is this idea of the six-week wonder or the 12-week wonder or even the one-year wonder in terms of remedying reading difficulties is unlikely. Many of the students with fragile, fragile approaches to reading are going to need years of intervention, and that's OK. Progress every year, because once students can read at about the fifth or sixth grade level, literally it kicks the barn door down in terms of access to knowledge and print. So, you know, they might not ever actually read at the 10th grade level, and that might be okay. But if we provide intensive and extensive interventions over time, we can give them access to the world of reading, which we don't know exactly where that is, but it's about fifth or sixth grade reading level. The other thing I want to say is that especially as students are older, we may need to think about how to provide these interventions within content area learning. So I know narrative books. My students and in my interventions love the narrative books, too. They really do. I love them, too. It's just hard to build the body of background knowledge they need with an overemphasis on 
a narrative books. So really think about that. And then before I open it up for questions, and we're going to have plenty of time for questions, I want to say, I think it's also important, many of you read to your students, right? When you read to your students, read at levels that are much higher than their reading level. Our students' listening comprehension is much higher than their reading comprehension. And that's another way to really enrich vocabulary and knowledge. So get the listening comprehension up. And you can use the listening comprehension to bootstrap reading comprehension. What I mean by that is that remember I like stretch text, not only stretch text. They need to read, let them read easy stuff, let them read stuff they, that's at their level, but don't only let them read that. So when you re read stretch texts, try doing listening comprehension on the topic they're going to read at a high level to build the background knowledge. And that can bootstrap the language and concept development that will enrich their access to stretch text. Okay. So before we open it up to questions, for myself, Amy, or each of you, and as well as hear your comments and um, supports and good ideas. Don't forget your good ideas that we need. Um, I just want to say, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you for doing the heavy lifting every day of teaching these students. Thank you for going into that classroom every day with all of your enthusiasm, with all of your su support, with all of your beliefs that they can and will, because you really are the true life changers in the world. You don't know that, but on a daily basis, you are literally shifting kids so that they will have much more successful lives. So thank you for doing this hard work. And I will keep doing the easy work so you can do the hard work. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for your presentation. I have three questions if we have time, but someone stop me. So the first is, has anyone compared the results of a student receiving intervention with anxiety or CBT outside support, such as we're giving a reading intervention in school and the child is simultaneously participating in CBT once weekly with their private therapist, compared to the reading intervention and anxiety that you guys are offering? So I just read Amy's lips. And she said, not that I know of. So <laughs> if she doesn't know about it, it probably doesn't exist. So okay. I'd say no. Any theories on it, if it would be as effective? You got to jump up. Get on up here, Amy. You're supposed to be here with me. You're my partner in crime. She's sort of sick. She's probably going to get me sick. <laughs> I'll, st I'll speak from a distance. Um, so there, I don't know of any studies that have looked at this. I would suspect that we would see very similar findings, right? So the CBT that's treating the anxiety, certainly I would hope that lots of kids who have anxiety are getting CBT services um, from a provider, you know. But unfortunately, what we know is that so few kids actually are. Um, but we would suspect that those kids who are getting CBT in the community setting or from a um, clinician elsewise would be having their anxiety reduced in the same way. And so we might expect that it would um, similarly allow them to kind of free up the cognitive resources for their learning time if that indeed is one of the mechanisms that's at play here. Right. Um, second question is, how do we access your anxiety toolbox? <laughs> um, so uh, we to be to be determined. So um, I I haven't actually thought about this previously. If I'm being honest, we've worked really hard to get it developed and get it out there and get it studied. And 
Then we decided that because the results were so promising that we were going to move forward with getting the information presented instead of waiting till both cohorts of our project were done. Um, and so it's all happening a bit fast. If you email me, I can certainly talk with you more about ways that we might be able to make it available or um, collaborate in ways where I can get aspects of it available or trainings and things that we have. Thank you. Um, and final question, I promise, is those of us, at least I know in the private world, we're referring to neuropsychology, neuropsychologists for assessments that are now ranging, I would say, eight to $12,000 for a family. And it looks like, this is LA, <laughs> it looks like a lot of your research is done without a discrepancy model and that you're able to group kids based on a reading measure. And I'm, so what I'm asking is, um, at what level would you suggest intervening, knowing that we might not have access to an IQ score unless we want to refer a family for eight to twelve thousand dollars assessment? Yeah. Um, so I come from the. I, I always teasingly, jokingly say I've been doing a postdoc with Jack Fletcher for twenty-two years. So um, uh, what what I can tell you, we have learned, is that those very expensive assessments for the vast majority of students. Not all, no, all hardly ever applies to anyone, um, are not necessary. That most of the school observations, the progress monitoring measures, the academic and behavioral measures that we collect are adequate for the vast majority of students. Sharon, I got out of bed to come hear you. <laughs> She did. So I did, really. I have a holy cold for those of you. It's not contagious, I hope. Tell, just tell them, though, before you ask your question, how you got your holy cold. Oh. It's so cool. Well, I just came back from the Vatican, uh, and there was a meeting on education with the poor, the disenfranchised and refugees. And on an 11-hour flight back, I sat next to a very sweet woman who sneezed for nine hours. <laughs> so I call it a holy cold. <laughs> but really, this is a holy moment for me to just underscore several of the things you said and then ask a question. Um, Maureen Lovett and Robin Morris, wonderful researchers that I've been doing intervention with for about 20 years. We, our last study absolutely underscores three of the points that you made. First, early intervention by first grade has so much better effects than anything we have done in 20 years. First. And those assessments we're going to get better and better at, and California just passed a bill. Some of you realize we have a bill that's both Northern California and Southern California to get ultimately at a screener that will be very simple that will help prevent some of the need for the neuropsych testing. That's, that's a separate issue. So first, early, and second, and I think this is the most wonderful thing you said that I want to underscore for everyone, and that is it's not about the program, but it is about the constellation of components that are evidence-based. And in the same study that Maureen and Robin and I did about intervention early, we compared different programs, very fine systematic phonics programs, and programs that had multi-components. Absolutely the multi-component programs were better than just the more systematic phonics, which were, of course, much better than the business as usual. But it's also the flexibility that we want teachers to feel when they're doing this work. It's all evidence-based, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this, X or Y. So I couldn't be more excited about that. But the third has a question. We, too, are really concerned about duration and how so many of our programs have to stop at one or two years. And one of the things that we're trying to do, my postdoc, wherever she is, Laura Reinhardt, are you here? There she is, thank goodness. Um, she and I are trying to work on whether or not an intervention by subtype, an early intervention by subtype, might be helpful. And I wondered if you have ever tried to do 
on this study or others, some kind of sub profile. We're using that big prediction by Ola Ozernoff, Palchik, our group, and John Gabrielli to do that. But whether you've done some of that work and have insights for us. Yeah, I, I really like that because what uh, Marianne is talking about is sort of an aptitude by treatment interaction effect, which people have been sort of, oh, la, 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 that's terrible, don't do that. But actually, identifying subtypes and trying to customize instruction based on that subtypes has gotten some momentum. And there's a couple of uh, studies that have provided support for that. We did that, actually it's published in Exceptional Children, and we did that with middle school students and listen, listen to these counterintuitive findings, okay? Here's the counterintuitive finding. We had um, three treatment groups. One treatment group is what you would call standardized. They got the multi-component intervention, you know, phonics, fluency, comprehension, and they got all of the components, and there was no consideration of students' needs. So everybody in the group got the same components, and they got them every day. Nobody said, oh, this kid is already really high on fluency. They only need reading comprehension, and none of that, OK? The second condition was one in which it was customized. In other words, if students were uh, high on word reading and low on fluency, we worked, we, we did not do any word reading, but we leveraged our time according to students' needs. So it was customized. And the third condition was just a business as usual condition, a control condition. The findings were that students did statistically significantly better on one outcome measure in the standardized group over the customized group. They both did better than the BAU. That's important, just like you said earlier. But the customized group did not do as well on all of our word reading um, outcomes. And I think it's because the tendency was to spend so much time on fluency and what people always say is comprehension, but it's not comprehension. It's usually question asking and other nonsense. I really like want to go on the record of saying we have to stop the way we're thinking about reading comprehension. It's completely mixed up. Yeah. It's completely mixed up. So we actually had a counterintuitive finding. Now that was with middle school kids. It might not be true with younger kids. Yeah, and of course we're thinking about the children who only, that very small group, who only have phoneme awareness issues. Oh, I think you are, get... Or only yeah. this, or only that. I so think that would be very different. I think yeah. that's worth pursuing. Right. I'd be excited by that. Right, but I think also what you're pointing to is the fact that so many people who are working on just fluency and comprehension are neglecting that's all true. those word that's study true. issues that it's they true. still have. Absolutely so I true. Think that would be very sensitive. That, that's, a, that's a good summary statement. Hi. Hi. Um, so we heard a lot about evidence-based interventions today. Yeah. Um, and I know at the beginning of the talks today, we saw a huge list of interventions. And only a few yeah, of those exactly. interventions were actually evidence-based interventions. And the speaker also mentioned that there are differing views about what an evidence-based intervention actually is. So I'm wondering, for those of us who are looking for evidence-based interventions, or the components, at least, of evidence-based intervention, is there a clearinghouse that will provide that information for us so we can know we're getting stuff that's really backed up by science? Yes. Um, so at the end of the talk um, that I was giving, the last couple of slides, the very last slide has about six or seven websites on it. And many of these are exactly what you're asking for. And they vary a little bit um, in terms of the audience. So one is um, effective child interventions, I think, and that is uh, much more of the clinical child type interventions and certainly um, helpful and certainly going to have a lot of information but is going to be directed more towards like a clinician in their private practice. Others on the site are going to include much more, um, they're going to be similar to like the What Works Clearinghouse. So they're going to have approaches that have been used in schools and they're going to show you the different populations that they've been used with and the different grades and, and um, help you be able to kind of tease that all apart. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Hi, Dr. Vaughn. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I do research on how bilinguals acquire um, reading comprehension, and so I followed your work really closely. I know this is a really relevant issue here in Southern California, and I just wanted to know if there's anything about what you presented today that you would tweak, modify, or add to when we're thinking about children who are using English as a second language. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. Um, just a couple of misunderstandings that I want to clarify, and then I will try to directly answer your question. First of all, I think one of the misunderstandings is that we have to wait for students' English language to develop before we provide them reading instruction in English. And I just want to say that you do not need to do that. Even very beginning English language learners print will support their oracy. So I'm not saying neglect their oracy. I'm not saying instead of. But I'm saying do not wait. Provide all of the same instruction you would provide to monolingual English students. Because as they develop knowledge of the alphabet, as they develop phonemic awareness, and by the way, especially in Spanish, the overlap in phonemic awareness in English and Spanish is quite high. So you can capitalize on their knowledge of phonemic awareness in Spanish. You can bootstrap what they know about sounds in Spanish to English. There's a couple that are very different, but they're you know, recognizable, and you can identify them. And jump them into literacy, because literacy will support oracy. So that's number one. Because this wait, oh, let's wait till they're in second or third grade and their language develops. It's just enough to make me throw myself on the floor and cry. Because you're depriving these students of access to one of the most valuable assets they have for improving their oracy, which is print. Number two, I think that many teachers are uh, anxious. I'll use the word. Many teachers are anxious about their knowledge and skills for teaching English learners. They feel like they don't have the confidence, and therefore they don't want to teach them, and so they're afraid they're going to make a mistake. If they have any knowledge and skills at all about teaching monolingual students, bring it to bear and say to yourself, meaning is the most important thing. So how can I just use, as you would always know, you know all of this, pictures and ways to make meaning more accessible to them. But I would say that all of the things we do are very enriching for bilingual students. And that if we do anything at all that's disturbing is we leave them out and don't provide access to these enriching activities because we are cautious that because they're L's, we won't do it right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Hi, I just had a question. I'm actually a high school reading teacher, and so I know a lot of your interventions <clears throat> excuse me, have been based for lower-aged students. I was just curious if you've done a similar study and in interventions um, for older students, and if so, have you found similar results? Yes, we have, and so has Marianne Wolf. Um, we have a high school study that's ninth grade. It's published in Journal of Learning Disabilities, and we actually got an effect size on the Gates McGinnity of 0.44, which is pretty high on the Gates. So um, we had have had reasonably good success in high school with um, reading interventions. But it was a two-year intervention. It was ninth to 10th grade. I said ninth grade, but it was ninth to 10th grade. Great, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Hello, I, I wanted to ask a question as a, I'm here as a parent, not as an educator. It's, I feel a little strange because it's like going to like A-Rod to ask him to <coughs> coach my son's t-ball game. But, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're what I got. So uh, I'm but, not on steroids. I just okay. Thank you. There you go. Well I, want, I want to get that perfectly clear. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I am. No, I'm not. Um, so, uh, in terms of building the confidence, so so much. I was looking at a lot of the buzzwords. Our daughter struggles with this, and and like where where to help curb anxiety is one of the techniques that you use in the classroom. Maybe we can use it at home. Is it where you show the number of books that, let's say you start a, a school year and there's a wall of fame and it's completely empty, a shelf, and then you just keep stacking all the books so that kids can't uh, deny what they have learned. Do you know what I'm saying? Like as a visual model, is that used? Is that helpful? Yeah, I mean, 
That's, that's not one of the approaches that we're using, but um, it's not to say it's not helpful. I think everything you can do to support the, your students and your children mm -hmm. um, feeling successful and feeling like they are making gains and that they can feel positive about what they're doing and what they're reading and how they're learning, anything you can do in that uh, avenue is going to be beneficial. And along those lines then, it's, it's kind of piggybacking on your comprehension, which I found very interesting. Um, other than asking them what, what they remembered or what they learned from it, um, are there things like uh, like treasure hunts, like where it's like there's clues and like at the end of like you string ten things together, kind of thing. They get a whatever. Is that is that effective? I'm just trying anything I can. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean I think for I want to say a couple of things. One, I think that as a parent, here's the privilege you have that teachers don't have. Teachers, you don't listen to this. <laughs> the, the privilege that you have is that your goal is not to teach your child to read. Your goal is to have fun with books with your child. And so I would not even be thinking about whether this was an effective approach, whether they were getting better because of me. You just want to know whether they're falling in love with books because of you. You just want to know whether you and your child are having wonderful experiences because of you. The rest is our job, and so you don't need to worry about it. All right. Thank you. And I, yeah. and I just wanted to offer one, and uh, if it helps anybody, it's for older readers. I'm, uh, I wrote a novel many years ago, 20 years ago, that has been used to teach reluctant readers. Um, it's called The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And for whatever it, for, oh, thank you. Um, for whatever it's worth, um, uh, uh, as a trick for all the, I'll never have this many teachers in, in a room again. Uh, basically, I've heard that, that sometimes they would read aloud from my book, use any book, and then, the, and then the teacher would say, listen, the next two pages, it gets a little racy. If I read them out loud, um, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble from the administration. And these kids that would not read a word were like, oh. <laughs> so I, I just offer that and thank you. That was an amazing that day. Thank fantastic. you. fantastic. What, one last question, then I have to run to the airport or I will have to move to L.A. <laughs> I hope to make it quick. Um, I know you said that it's more important to have the components of, the, of programs and not the components itself. As a parent, how do I have confidence that the teacher is doing things to fidelity? Because I need to try to figure out how to help my kid, right? So so you know this I have <laughs> I have concerns when no. when people start picking and choosing whether it's evidence based and whether it's to fidelity and whether it's gonna work. I just wanna get into the Amen group on that and say you have every reason to worry. You have every reason to be concerned. Um, it's not a buffet. You don't go and just say, I'm going to pick this and this and this. Um, and I hope I didn't sound like that, because if I did, I want to um, withdraw that comment. Uh, what I meant is that there are known evidence-based practices that can be integrated into an effective way to design instruction. And how you will know whether or not that's occurring um, anyone have a good answer for that? Yeah, go. So, I think one way to do that is there are many programs that have the components. Right. Yeah. And I think you have a rubric of what the evidence says are components. What, what components are included in that program? and a little checklist, okay, it has this, boom, this, and, and then when you go down, you say, okay, this could be an effective program because it has those components. Picking and choosing and just doing a little here, it's not integrated. No. A good program has all of those components integrated. Thank you. So that's one way that can help you understand. Thank you, Joan, and um, since I seem to be speaking for Amy, from Amy and me, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.